Like his first impeachment has has not ruled out convicting President Trump, but John Carl, our senior Washington correspondent, getting a conviction here an uphill fight. George, the, the math is you need two thirds of the Senate to vote to convict. Fifty uh, Democrats, you're likely to get all 50 of them. That means you need 17 Republicans to vote that Donald Trump is guilty and to vote to convict him. Uh, I see that as almost a zero percent uh, probability. In the immediate aftermath. Math of the riot, uh, it looked like a real possibility. And 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 look, uh, Mitch McConnell has not said how he would vote. Uh, but what you're seeing most of the Republicans say is that they don't believe that this is constitutional. Now that Donald Trump has left office, there's really uh, no need to vote to convict him and remove him from office because he's already gone. And there you see they have approached the Senate doors right now. They will be announced by the acting Sergeant Arms. Of course, of course the Sergeant Arms for both the House and the Senate were relieved of duty uh, after the events of January 6th. Congressman Raskin, you see him right there, lost a son on New Year's Eve, a 25-year-old son uh, to suicide, was actually in the House chamber on January 6th with his other daughter, uh, described as some of the most terrifying moments of his life, chosen by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to lead this effort right now. And he will be reading that article of impeachment once they walk into the Senate chamber. There you see the president pro tem of the Senate, Patrick Leahy, who, as Rachel Scott said, will be presiding over the trial. Let's listen in. Familiar sight to all you remember is one year ago, a little over a year ago, when the House impeachment managers walked over the first article of impeachment against President Trump. Now, the new majority leader, Senator Chuck Schumer of New York. I ask unanimous consent that the quorum call be vitiated. Without objection. The hour of 7, eight, uh, 7 p.m. having arrived, the acting sergeant arms will present the managers on the part of the House of Representatives. Mr. President and members of the Senate, I announce the presence of the managers on the part of the House of Representatives to conduct proceedings on behalf of the House concerning the impeachment of Donald John Trump, former President of the United States. The managers on the part of the House will be received and escorted to the well of the Senate. Nine impeachment managers for the House. There were seven in President Trump's first trial. Thirteen in the impeachment trial of President Clinton. President Arms will make the proclamation. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. All persons are commanded to keep silent on pain of imprisonment while the House of Representatives is exhibiting to the Senate of the United States an article of impeachment against Donald John Trump, former President of the United States. The managers on the part of the House will proceed. Congressman Raskin, Jamie Raskin of Maryland. Mr. President, the managers on the part of the House of Representatives are here and present and ready to present the article of impeachment, which has been preferred by the House of Representatives against Donald John Trump, former President of the United States. The House adopted the following resolution, which with the permission of the Senate, I will read. House Resolution 40 in the House of Representatives, United States, January 13th, 
2021, resolved that Mr. Raskin, Ms. DeGette, Mr. Cicilline, Mr. Castro of Texas, Mr. Swalwell, Mr. Liu, Ms. Plaskett, Mr. Nagus, and Ms. Dean are appointed managers to conduct the impeachment trial against Donald John Trump, President of the United States, that a message be sent to the Senate to inform the Senate of the appointments, and that the manager so appointed may, in connection with the preparation and the conduct of the trial, exhibit the article of impeachment to the Senate and take all other actions necessary, which may include the following, employing legal, clerical, and other necessary assistance, and incurring such other expenses as, as may be necessary to be paid from amounts available to the Committee on the Judiciary under applicable expense or resolutions or from the applicable accounts of the House of Representatives, to sending for persons and papers and filing with the Secretary of the Senate on the part of the House of Representatives any pleadings in conjunction with or subsequent to the exhibition of the articles of impeachment that the managers consider necessary. Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House of Representatives. With the permission of the Senate, I will now read the article of impeachment. House Resolution 24 in the House of Representatives, United States, January 13th, 2021, resolved that Donald John Trump, President of the United States, is impeached for high crimes and misdemeanors, and that the following article of impeachment be exhibited to the United States Senate. Article of impeachment exhibited by the House of Representatives of the United States of America in the name of itself and of the people of the United States of America against Donald John Trump, President of the United States of America, in maintenance and support of its impeachment against him for high crimes and misdemeanors. Article 1, incitement of insurrection. The Constitution provides that the House of Representatives shall have the sole power of impeachment and the President shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Further, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment of the, to the Constitution prohibits any person who has, quote, engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the United States from holding any office under the United States, unquote. In his conduct, while President of the United States and in violation of his constitutional oath faithfully to execute the office of the President of the United States and to the best of his ability preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States and in violation of his constitutional duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed, Donald John Trump engaged in high crimes and misdemeanors by inciting violence against the government of the United States. In that, on January 6, 2021, pursuant to the 12th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, the Vice President of the United States, the House of Representatives, and the Senate met at the United States Capitol for a joint session of Congress to count the votes of the Electoral College. In the months preceding the joint session, President Trump repeatedly issued false statements asserting that the presidential election results were the product of widespread fraud and should not be accepted by the American people or certified by state or federal officials. Shortly before the joint session commenced, President Trump addressed a crowd at the Ellipse in Washington, D.C. There, he reiterated false claims that we won this election and we won it by a landslide. He also willfully made statements that in context encouraged and foreseeably resulted in lawless action at the Capitol, such as, if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Thus incited by President Trump, members of the crowd he had addressed in an attempt to, among other objectives, interfere with the joint session's solemn constitutional duty to certify the results of the 2020 presidential election, unlawfully breached and vandalized the Capitol, injured and killed law enforcement personnel, menaced members of Congress, the vice president and congressional personnel, and engaged in other violent, deadly, destructive, and seditious acts. President Trump's conduct on January 6, 2021, followed his prior efforts to subvert and obstruct the certification of the results of the 2020 presidential election. Those prior efforts included a phone call on January 2nd, 2021, during which President Trump urged the Secretary of State of Georgia, Brad Raffensperger, to, quote, find enough votes to overturn the Georgia presidential election results and threatened Secretary Raffensperger if he failed to do 
so. In all this, President Trump gravely endangered the security of the United States and its institutions of government. He threatened the integrity of the democratic system, interfered with the peaceful transition of power, and imperiled a co-equal branch of government. He thereby betrayed his trust as president to the manifest injury of the people of the United States. Wherefore, Donald John Trump, by such conduct, has demonstrated that he will remain a threat to national security, democracy, and the Constitution if allowed to remain in office, and has acted in a manner grossly incompatible with self-governance and the rule of law. Donald John Trump thus warrants impeachment and trial, removal from office, and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States. Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House of Representatives. Mr. President, that completes the exhibition of the article of impeachment against Donald John Trump, President of the United States. The managers request that the Senate take order for the trial. The managers now request leave to withdraw. Thank you, Mr. Raskin. And the Senate will duly notify the House of Representatives who is ready to proceed with the trial. Thank you. The article of impeachment delivered right there. Congressman Jamie Raskin, lead House impeachment manager. Those members of the House, the impeachment managers, the nine impeachment managers will now withdraw to the House. The Senate will reconvene tomorrow where all the senators will be sworn in as jurors in the trial. But as we said, that trial will be postponed until the week of February 8th, giving President Trump time to prepare his defense. I want to bring in Dan Abrams as the president is preparing his defense. We heard John Carl say right now, at least, we know those votes aren't there. The question is what kind of evidence will come forward between now and when the trial begins. Yeah, I mean, because everything that we just heard is known. We know what the president said at the rally. We know a lot of what the president did and said leading up to the rally. And according to John Carl, that's not enough uh, for most of the Republican jurors. So the question becomes, what else might they find? And I think the only thing that they could find that might make the difference would be something that the president did or didn't do on January the 6th not leading up to it, not in the days before, but specifically there on the 6th of January. And that's going to be the question. Can they find anything else? Is there anything else to find? And Kate Shaw, also our legal analyst, professor of law, Cardozo Law School. It appears that many of the Republican senators want to avoid that question at all, focus on process. They say it's unconstitutional to impeach a former president. Some are raising a question. The fact that Chief Justice Roberts is not going to preside is another reason that this trial is unconstitutional. Well, George, of course, it's right we've never had a trial for a former president, but impeachment is a rarely used mechanism in our scheme. We had only ever impeached two presidents prior to the administration of Donald Trump. Um, and impeachment is available for other federal officials, and there have been trials of former federal officials, just not former presidents. So in 1876, a cabinet secretary was impeached and tried after resigning. The Senate considered the question of whether it had jurisdiction to hold the trial, but concluded that it did. And, you know, I'm not sure there's any really decisive evidence evidence that the president's treatment should be different. If the misconduct happens in office, the argument goes, surely the power to impeach, which is the constitutional remedy for high crimes and misdemeanors, uh, should extend to former presidents. Kate Shaw, thanks very much. Finally, Terry Moran, our senior national correspondent. I don't think it's quite sunk in just how extraordinary this is. We've just watched a president of the United States impeach for a second time, this time for incitement of insurrection, seditious acts against the government he led. It is extraordinary, George, and there's great drama uh, in this moment and in the coming trial, but there's also dread, I think. Our previous impeachments have been about policy, Andrew Johnson, about personal behavior, Bill Clinton, and, and to some degree behavior in office with Donald Trump. This is, about, this is about the insurrection, an attack on our democracy. There's bloodshed, the deaths mentioned in the article of impeachment itself, and beneath that, this struggle we've been having for a long time, this extreme polarization not about the direction of our country, but about 
the nature of the country, the very reality that we live in. And I think resolving that through this is, is going to be impossible. It's another chapter of these extraordinary politics, the kinds of politics that you see, frankly, in democracies that are in crisis. Right, where the jurors themselves, the managers bringing the charges, were all witnesses to the events in question. Terry Moran, thanks very much. We're going to return now to our regular programming. Coverage of this will continue on ABC News Live, of course, on Nightline tonight. And I'll see you tomorrow on GMA. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Once again, you are watching ABC News Live Prime. Let's bring in our Devin Dwyer. Devin, as we've mentioned, this is truly uncharted territory here, making arguments about precedent from both sides a little bit difficult. In particular, I've been kind of struck by Senator Rand Paul, who says that he's going to try to force this vote, basically questioning the Constitution, if this is within the constitutional rights to bring a private citizen to have this kind of trial. Yeah, and you know what's interesting, Lindsay, is that we're going to hear so much over the next few weeks about the constitutionality of this already. A lot of Republicans lining up against that. Um, but this is an inherently political process. Impeachment is something that happens in the Congress. Uh, the judges and judicial branch uh, of the United States are not really involved. So there isn't going to be an umpire here that's going to issue some sort of ruling as to whether this is constitutional or not, um, in all likelihood. I mean, I mean, this could eventually end up in the court system, but all signs are that it won't go there. So this is really up to the senators themselves to answer that question and come up with their own conclusion. Uh, now, the numbers are there for this trial to proceed. Rand Paul can hold that vote. He likely will try it uh, sometime when they reconvene. And because Mitt Romney, as one Republican among others, will likely want this to go forward, it will. Uh, but we're going to hear a lot about the constitutionality, and it's really open to debate because, as you said, there's no clear precedent and the text of the Constitution is open to interpretation. Right. Many already questioning if it is, in fact, legitimate. And, Devin, both sides are also using the next two weeks to prepare arguments. What do we know about the president's defense? Yeah, the president has not actually spoken out about this case now uh, directly since he left office. So how he's feeling at this moment uh, is an open question. But we do know, Lindsay, that he's hired a lawyer from South Carolina, a veteran Republican, Butch Bowers. Butch Bowers hasn't made himself public yet. He hasn't given a speech taken to the podium. Uh, you see him here with the former South Carolina governor, Mark Sanford. But Butch Bowers served in the Bush administration, uh, the second Bush, that is. And he also has experience with impeachment at the state level. Level. He represented former Governor Mark Sanford in, an, in a House, uh, state House impeachment trial back in 2009, actually helped him get off. Uh, so here's somebody who's going to come sailing in and likely point to some of these constitutional arguments uh, and perhaps resurrect some of the president's claims about the, the, uh, the election results themselves, Lindsay. Right. And of course, Rudy Giuliani was not able to represent him in this case right. because he may also be uh, a witness. A witness. Right. All exactly. Right. Devin Dwyer, our thanks to you. L let's bring in Rachel. Rachel Scott at this point. Rachel, give us a sense of, of the mood in there and also what comes next. Well, it's solemn, right? I mean, this is history. That walkover delivering that article of impeachment over to the Senate, setting the stage uh, for an impeachment trial of a former president, something that we have not seen before in our nation's history. So tomorrow, we will see those senators, the jurors in this trial, be sworn in. We're also expecting to see Senator Patrick Leahy, who will be presiding over this trial, also be sworn in. He will be taking a special oath to be uh, impartial during this trial. He he will still have a vote, though, at the end of it. And then we essentially hit the pause button here, Lindsay. Uh, that trial is not expected to begin in earnest until the week of February 8th. And that delay was meant to give both sides some time to prepare. Trump has really struggled to put together a defense team. Democrats also wanted to be able to push through President Joe Biden's cabinet picks. That will give them some try time to try and do that as well. And then the week of February 8th, we will see those opening arguments. Now, Senator Chuck Schumer, he is expecting this trial to not be too long, not as long as the last one, which was 21 days. He says once this trial does get underway, he expects it to be quick, Lindsay. And, and Rachel, this Senate trial could certainly put many Republicans in kind of a tight spot and, and further expose the, the growing rift in the Republican Party. Yeah.
Yeah, it can. And right now, the Republican Party is fractured. I mean, just take a look at this. Right now, you have Republican leader Mitch McConnell saying that he does not know how he is going to vote. That is just totally different from his stance just the last time around for the first impeachment trial of uh, former President Donald Trump. You have some Republicans here on the fence. You have a handful of them, like Senator Mitt Romney, the only one to vote to convict the last time around from the Republican Party. Uh, he says he believes that the president did commit impeachable offenses, but he's going to leave his mind open to hear some of the cases there. And then you have other Republicans that are rallying behind the president. But bottom line here, we have not heard from a single Republican senator who has come forward to say they plan to vote to convict the president. And Democrats can't go out this alone. They're going to need at least 17 Republicans to join their effort to convict the former president. Lindsay. All right, Rachel Scott, thanks so much. Let's now bring in Terry Moran. And, and Terry, I'm kind of fixated on, on this idea of Senator Rand Paul saying that he's going to uh, try to force this vote to see if they can even pr pr proceed with this trial, if it's even legitimate. And he does have a point. He does. The, the Constitution explicitly says uh, that the president shall be removed from office upon impeachment and conviction of, of the crime. So there is a, a, a school of thought that it's the person in office subject to impeachment. Donald J. Trump is no longer in office. And yet the Senate in the past has, uh, has uh, tried and convicted office holders, judges, and a, and a uh, uh, an executive officer who resigned in order to disqualify them from future office. The president, though, is different. And I think what we're looking at here is part of this this dreadful struggle in our country, this extreme political partisan polarization, where Democrats and Republicans are at odds, not just over the direction of the country, but on who we are, with Republicans increasingly not seeing Democrats as legitimate guardians of the nation's interests, many Democrats feeling the same way. And at the heart of this impeachment is this, this fact, people died. There's bloodshed mentioned in the article of impeachment itself. We've never had that. Andrew Johnson impeached for policy differences, Bill Clinton for personal behavior, Donald Trump the first time for abuse of office. People died here. And this is, this is the sign in, in some ways of a democracy in crisis, uh, that we can't even agree on the direction here. What we are going to see is, is a struggle, not just about the future of Donald Trump, but about the nature of the country. And I don't think it's going to be resolved. Yeah, I have a feeling that you're right, Terry. It, it, ten Republicans, as you know, are members of the House voted to impeach. We've seen how many members of their own party have, have treated them. With that in mind, do you think that 17 Republicans will vote to convict in the Senate? And how large does uh, Senator Mitch McConnell loom? I mean, because it was really interesting that he wanted to go on the record to say, I haven't decided how I'm going to vote yet. Right. Mitch McConnell greenlighted this when he was majority leader. And, you know, Mitch McConnell, you could make the case as the most consequential political figure in 21st century America, an unlikely one. But he really has, uh, he's shaped the federal judiciary, the federal budget. He's, he's really been in charge, and he let this go forward. So he is clearly open to uh, an investigation and an airing of Donald Trump's words and deeds in there's more evidence coming out about those uh, in in connection with this insurrection. If he votes to convict, it's possible he'd take a number of Republicans with him. But look at what's happening in the country. You know, we talk about a rift in the in the Republican Party. It's not really that big. This is Donald Trump's party still, no matter what happens to him. He's changed the Republican Party into something more like a nationalist party, a nationalist party where uh, people who define themselves as the guardians of the interests and values of the nation are the only legitimate power. That's what he was saying. That's what he tried to do in stealing this election, that Democrats aren't legitimate. And he found tens of millions of Americans to believe that lie, to support it, to agree with it. I, I can't imagine that Republicans who want a future in their party, a future in politics, are, are going to buck that very large trend through the Republican Party. Love it when you put on your historian hat. Always so grateful for your insight, Terry. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Turning now to President Biden's push to get COVID relief to the American people, the president signed several executive orders today and then answered questions. Our Cecilia Vega has more on the latest steps Biden is taking to roll back the Trump agenda and deliver some much needed COVID relief. Tonight, President Joe Biden signing an executive order reversing his predecessor's ban on transgender troops serving in the military. 
one of 23 executive actions he's taken so far aimed squarely at rolling back the Trump agenda. And what I'm doing is enabling all qualified Americans to serve their country in uniform. And today signing another order pushing the federal government to buy American and to publicly explain their reasoning if they decide to buy foreign. The previous administration didn't take it seriously enough. Federal agencies waived the Buy American requirement without much pushback at all. There's no timeline, but he wants the government's fleet of vehicles to be converted to Made in America electric, including postal vehicles. But what comes next is not something he can do with just the stroke of a pen. The president needs Congress to pass his nearly $2 trillion COVID relief package, his plan to get $1,400 checks into the hands of struggling Americans, extend unemployment benefits, help small businesses, and ramp up vaccine distribution. His goal to pass the package with support from Democrats as well as Republicans. Here's the deal. Um, I have been doing legislative negotiations for a large part of my life. I know how the system works. But Republicans are already sounding the alarm, including Utah's Mitt Romney, who has signaled he's willing to negotiate with Democrats. He now says he has serious concerns about the price tag. But the total figure is, is pretty uh, uh, shocking, if you will. And, uh, and the idea that we need a stimulus is a little hard to understand. And there's already resistance from Democrats, too, who say they should use their narrow Senate majority to push through Biden's plan now, with Vice President Kamala Harris casting the deciding vote. But what we cannot do is wait weeks and weeks and months and months to go forward. We have got to act now. Senator Bernie Sanders stressing swift action. Cecilia Vega joins us now from the White House. Cecilia, the Biden team faces a big first test here with Congress. And as we heard in your piece, the 50-50 Senate makes it nearly impossible to please everyone. But negotiations with a bipartisan group is now underway. Is the White House optimistic that this can get done? Yeah, Lindsay, they are very optimistic, but here's the reality. President Biden today said that it's going to be a couple of weeks still before we know exactly where Republicans stand on this plan. And remember, time is of the essence. He just said a couple of days ago that this is a national emergency. He wants these Republicans. He says he's been talking to congressional leadership. He doesn't want to do this alone, but he also didn't rule out the possibility today of having to do this alone without Republican support. But Lindsay, let me just give you a sign of the times of exactly where things stand right now. Mitch McConnell today, called this first draft. He said it misses the mark. Cecilia Vega, our thanks to you. Less than one week after being sworn in, President Biden and his administration are already sending some mixed messages about when the vaccine will be available to Americans. And now we're learning that one vaccine may not be as effective against one of the COVID variants. All this as the world inches closer to the 100 million total infected mark. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has the latest on our nation's COVID battle. Tonight, as states struggle to vaccinate millions with dwindling supply, the president says he's hopeful Americans who want a vaccine will be able to get one by spring. I think it'll be this spring. I think we'll be able to do that this spring. I feel confident that uh, by summer we're going to be well on our way to heading toward herd immunity. The president warning the death toll could top 600,000 before things get better. He's now aiming for 1.5 million doses every day. I think we may be able to get that to 150, uh, 1.5 million a day rather than 1 million a day. Hours earlier, his vaccine advisor cautioned it could be the fall before every American is vaccinated. The bottom line is I wish I could tell you there's plenty of vaccine and we can fill the, all these uh, endless amount of appointments. We can't. Dr. David Kessler says vaccinating the country by April and May is just not going to happen. I think this is going to take us uh, into the fall. We got to get there before next uh, winter. Nearly 23 million of the 41 million doses distributed have been administered. The Trump administration had hoped to reach 20 million by the end of December. The need for vaccines more urgent than ever. The UK variant already in at least 26 states is more contagious and British health officials warn it could also be more deadly. Dr. Fauci saying he believes those British scientists. They became convinced that it is in fact uh, a bit more virulent, namely make, making it more difficult when you get to the point of serious disease and even death. So I believe their data.
The vaccines work against the variants, but one study showing the Moderna vaccine may be less protective against the South African strain. So the company is now studying a possible booster shot. We need to keep watching it and testing against it and making sure until we've got it beaten back, that we're planning ahead and we're being careful. The U.S. now barring non-U.S. citizens from traveling from South Africa, in addition to Brazil, the U.K., Ireland, and 26 countries across Europe. More contagious variants threatening to reverse new signs of hope, like a decline in deaths and hospitalizations in this country. California today lifting its stay-at-home order across much of the state. We've been struggling and, you know, we were worried, but this is a little bit of a weight off the shoulder. So it's a little bit. There's still weight on the shoulder, so we'll see what happens. Some relief for some now that that stay-at-home order has been lifted there. Eva Pilgrim joins us now from outside of a mass vaccination site at the Javits Center. Eva Moderna today said that it's looking at possible booster options for its vaccine in light of those variants. So what's become clear is the need for more vaccine. What was the president's reaction to that? Well, the president late today actually told us that he has gotten commitments from vaccine producers to make more vaccines in a relatively short period of time. What he didn't tell us, though, some very important details, which vaccine producers he's been able to get those commitments from and just how many additional vaccines we may see um, being delivered to these vaccine sites. Lindsay. That sounds like more help is on the way. Much needed help at that. Eva Pilgrim, our thanks to you. And while cases are beginning to come down here in the U.S., in the U.K., that dangerous and more contagious variant is sweeping through that nation. Ian Pennell has more on the surge there. Tonight, the impact of the more contagious and potentially more deadly U.K. variant playing out in British hospitals. Already stretched thin as they struggle to treat a seemingly endless tide of patients. Medics pleading for help as they face record numbers on wards, in ICUs and on ventilators. More than 3,500 patients admitted today alone. I feel like I want to cry in many moments. Despite a lockdown and success rolling out the vaccine, Seen the UK with one of the highest death rates in the world, now closing in on 100,000. And hospitals remain as busy as any time in this pandemic. Better treatment means more survivors, but the stress on staff and resources is relentless. This Neurosurgeon is Dolin Bagawati told me today that already exhausted hospital staff are working round the clock. Porters, cleaners as well as doctors and nurses, are exhausted because they are walk working all the hours that God sends and it's still coming. It's an oncoming storm that doesn't seem to be abating. For families and patients, the fight to beat COVID is a long one. We've just bought ourselves a new beautiful bungalow which we're supposed to be moving into. And it's our dream. And I may not see it. Anna Urasashi's father has been in the ICU since December 6th. We just prayed. We thank God and we prayed again. He's a miracle. Tony Brown hasn't seen his wife, Linda, in seven weeks. I miss her. I really miss her. Really painful to watch that our thanks to Ian. When we come back, the protests that left buildings damaged in one city after disturbing images emerged of a police officer ramming his SUV through a crowd. Putin's pickle. If he leaves his fiercest critic behind bars, do the protests against the Kremlin continue? Or does he let the man many believe he allowed to be poisoned walk free? But up next, Dr. Anthony Fauci reveals new details about the moment he feared for his life and the state he believes could be approaching herd immunity. Our wide-ranging conversation with him next. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Do you believe in The reality is our country can collapse from within. Why, my man? Why? 
you see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. We will guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Big, big hug, Richard. We taught all our patients how much they are loved. We hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. There's nobody that has not been touched by this pandemic. It's tough right now because, you know, we're struggling. We have serious demand issues. For the first time ever, we have to have each other's backs. I see color. Here we go. We're all in this together, and we have to make this work. Well done, Spurs. This is all we got. Woo! Wicked Tuna, new season, Sunday, February 21st at 9 on National Geographic. Dr. Anthony Fauci joins us now. Thanks so much for your time tonight, doctor. Of course, this is the fifth full day of the Biden administration, but there seems to be a common problem that this administration has to contend with. It's essentially spilling over from the previous one. Many states have complained about a lack or shortage of vaccine doses. This weekend, the head of the CDC said, one of the biggest problems right now is I can't tell you how much vaccine we have, and if I can't tell it to you, then I can't tell it to the governors. What in your mind needs to be done to get this right as far as smoothing out the process between the federal government and the states and American arms. You know, I think you just said it. And, and what has happened before is that there was an inconsistent partnership between the federal government and the states. I mean, on the one hand, you don't want the federal government to do it all, but you also don't want to just leave the states on their own and say, here you go, here's the, vi here's the vaccine, go ahead and do what you want. You've got to have a steady flow of material. You've got to have communication. You have to have coordination and cooperation. And that's one of the things that right from the beginning, President Biden had said, among many other things that he wants to do, is strengthen the synergy and the cooperation and collaboration between the federal government and the states. And that's got to get fixed because you're absolutely right. There are some areas of the country where there's vaccine lying around and it's not going into people's arms. And as you know, many Americans just want to know when are things going to be normal again. Today, the co-chair of the Biden COVID task force said he believes it won't be until the fall before everyone who wants a vaccine can get one. Is that your view as far as timeline? And what do you think that life, once we have the vaccine for anyone who wants to get it, what does America look like? Are still social distancing and still masks? I think there will be a strong turn towards a degree of normality. I don't think it's going to be absolutely the way it was months before we even knew about COVID-19. I think there will be some public health issues that would need to be addressed, but I don't think it's going to be anything like it is right now or a couple of months ago where you essentially had shutdown of many aspects of society. I think it will gradually get better when you talk about vaccine available for people. You got to distinguish vaccine available for any kind of a person, not necessarily one who's in category 1A or 1B or 1C, but when it gets open for anybody who feels they would like to get vaccinated, that would at least be able to get it. I think that's going to be much sooner than the fall. I think it likely will be sometime in April, but 
The fall will be when you get to the point where everyone will have been vaccinated who wanted it. Now, vaccine manufacturer Merck stopped development of both of its COVID vaccines today, citing a lack of immunity to the virus. How much is the U.S. government now banking on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which has yet to be approved? And if that can't be distributed in the near future, will the timeline that you just mentioned get pushed back even further? No, I think if if J if J and J or the Janssen product comes through with an efficacy that's good enough to be able to be in the mix, that will be very helpful to get things done even sooner than we thought. But I think when you talk about Moderna and you talk about Pfizer and the possibility of getting even more from them, I think we can do it without it, though it's we'd be much welcome to get the Johnson & Johnson product. Now let's talk about these new strains. Thankfully, it appears thus far the more concerning South African strain is not in the U.S. Given how contagious the new U.K. strain is, some have suggested grocery store trips are much more risky at this point. The former head of the CDC suggested over the weekend that New Yorkers should consider only leaving home for essential activities. Do Americans need to be kind of back in that same mindset where we were in March and and try to stay home even more uh, to avoid these new, more contagious variants? Well, I mean, it is estimated that we will have a dominance of the strain that was first in the UK and is now dominant in the UK. Some estimates would be that sometime by the end of March or early April, it will be the dominant strain. It is about, according to the estimates, of the people in the UK about twice as transmissible and maybe even increase in its virulence or its ability to cause serious disease. Whenever you have that, you obviously need to double down a bit on the public health measures, which we should be doing anyway. In other words, we should be doing the kinds of things that we've been speaking about consistently now for months. Physical distancing, uniform wearing of masks, avoiding congregate settings, particularly indoors, doing things weather permitted as much outdoors as we possibly can, and washing your hands very frequently. If everyone uniformly did that, regardless of the mutant involved, we'd be much better off. Some have suggested that in especially hard hit states like North Dakota, that the population may be getting close to or has already reached herd immunity as so many people there have already been infected and there aren't as many residents to vaccinate. Do you think that that's the case, that North Dakota or possibly some other states have already reached herd immunity? You know, I think that they would be approaching a degree of protection from the standpoint of already having a lot of people. You've got to be careful because herd immunity is not an absolute yes or no. If you have a lot of people who are either vaccinated or have already been infected, you could approach herd immunity and get a degree of protection from it as opposed to the absolute, which we know with some diseases what that number is. Our most experience with that is with measles. We know with the highly contagious measles and a very effective vaccine, 98% effective, we know that when you get below a certain level of immunity in the community, that you start to lose that protection from herd immunity. We don't yet quite know what that number is for COVID. We think it's somewhere around 70 to 85%. But when you get up to 50, 60 percent, you're getting close to it. So it isn't as if you don't have any effect with that. You're starting to get some good effect. So in answer to your question, it could be that given the amount of infection that have occurred there and the fact that they're doing pretty good on the distribution of vaccine, they may already be approaching that level of herd immunity, even though they're not absolutely there yet. Now, in a wide-ranging interview with the New York Times, you talked about how in the heart of the pandemic, the president asked you to be more positive. What was that like in the time, and how difficult was it for you to feel like you were on the sidelines, unable to speak up honestly about what the reality was? Well, I did speak up honestly about what the reality was, and that likely was one of the things that put me on the sideline. I mean, I, I was always, and I was not, it, it didn't give me any great pleasure in contradicting the president of the United States. As I've said, you know, in that interview that I gave that I have a great deal of respect for the office of the presidency, but there comes a time when you hear things that are being said that are just not reality. They're not in accordance with what is actually going on. 
And at that point, in order to maintain my integrity as well as the good of the American public, I had to come forth and say, no, I'm sorry, I disagree with you. We're not turning the corner. Things are not as good as you're saying as it is. And as you know, when I did that, uh, for one reason or other, I was not as able to be public as possible because I was not let out to the press. Biden will be the seventh president that you've now advised. And I do want to briefly get your thoughts on this past year. Your life has personally been threatened during this pandemic. And you said uh, that you opened a letter at one point and white powder popped out all over you. What happened next in that moment? And also, if you could tell us a bit about the conversation that you had with your wife about the pros and cons of potentially quitting uh, once your life and your wife and your children's lives were being threatened. You know, I, this is the life I chose, and this is what I do. So as strange as it may seem to people, you know, threats on my life, uh, uh, harassment of me does not bother me as much at all as the effect it has on my wife and my children, because my wife is being harassed, my children, my adult daughters are getting harassed. You know, with all of the information that's out there online, everybody knows one's phone number, one's address. There's very little you can do about it. So I get more concerned, if not outraged, at the impact it has on my children. With regard to what you asked the day that I innocently and probably stupidly opened up an envelope and just pulled out a letter and the powder came all over my face and all over my, 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 my chest and my shirt, um, you know, ultimately, as I said in the interview, uh, I, I said, well, there's one of three possibilities here. Either it's a hoax, uh, it's anthrax, which would mean that I'd have to go on ciprofloxacin for about a month or two, or it's ricin, which means I'm a dead duck no matter what I do. You know, it was interesting. I took a bit of a fatalistic view from that. Thank goodness my security detail, you know, told me, don't move, stay in the room, don't come out because we'll be contaminating everything and we'll get the hazmat people there. And they did, and I had to get, you know, they sprayed me with my clothes on, with my clothes off. It, it was terrible. But the most negative part about that entire experience was it frightened the heck out of my children when they found out about it, and my wife, too. So that's the thing that, that people don't understand, that's the thing that really bothers me. I mean, I've decided I'm doing something that might be dangerous, but that's it. I chose it. My children did not chose that, did not choose that. So that's the thing that bothered me the most. Right, understandably so. Lastly, I'd like to play a soundbite from your former colleague, Dr. Deborah Bergs, from over the weekend when asked about what her biggest mistake was this past year. I always feel like I could have done more, been more outspoken, uh, maybe been more outspoken publicly, publicly. I didn't know all the consequences of all of these issues. If you are able to reflect back on this crazy past year, what would you say would be your biggest mistake? Or beyond that, maybe if you could have a, a mulligan and do something over, what would it be? You know, very likely it would have been early, early on to really try to get as much more information uh, about the fact that this virus can be spread by people without symptoms. And once you know that it can be spread with people without symptoms, you don't have to have a lot of sick people around for you to do some dramatic public health recommendations because you know that insidiously it is under the radar screen spreading. We did not know that then. I wish that I had known it earlier than I knew it because if I did, there would have likely been differences and more stringent recommendations. Sure, makes a lot of sense. Dr. Anthony Fauci, thank you as always for your time, your knowledge, your insight. We appreciate it. Good to be with you. Thank you for having me. Still ahead here on Prime, the Trump era policy reversed by President Biden and impacts just who's allowed to serve in our military. The NFL has a rule aimed at increasing minority representation in its coaching ranks, but some say it's not working. Our conversation with one former NFL coach and major news in the presidential pet front. We take a closer look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, Budweiser explains why they will not be advertising in this year's Super Bowl for the first time in 37 years. This is
is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source, ABC News. Breaking news, live events as they happen, streaming live, non-stop, straight to you. Original, on the edge, breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN, all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want, free. And imagine the most celebrated, epic live event and moments this is live. all playing out right before your eyes. See those flames behind me? And go deeper inside the groundbreaking exclusives from the campaign trail only ABC News gets. Watch ABC Somebody News Live come. right now and anytime. <laughs> Streaming on Roku, Hulu, Facebook, and ABCnews.com. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere right to you. ABC News Live. We will guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Give me a big hug, Richard. We tell all our patients how much they are loved. We hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. <laughs> Mornings may look different these days, but where you start your day, where you spend your mornings, where you get connected to everything that's happening. And face it, there's a whole lot happening in our world these days. Where you get all the breaking new information of the day to help you navigate through these times. That's why we're here. Good morning, sunshine. And making sure you start your day off with a smile and some sunshine. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Oh, how I love saying that. Wake me up. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for Overall Excellence in Television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. Welcome back, everybody. Today was move-in day for two new White House residents, Champ and Major Biden, the President and First Lady's German Shepherd. So we take a look by the numbers at presidential pets and why Major is now making history. Major is the first ever shelter dog in the White House. The Bidens adopted him two years ago from the Delaware Humane Association after he had been surrendered and was not doing well. In America's long history of presidential pets, we've had a first snake, first possum, first sheep, first badger, and even a first raccoon named Rebecca that was walked on a leash, but never a rescue dog until now. Another noteworthy pet, Pushinka, was a 1961 gift to the Kennedy family at the height of the Cold War. Pushinka's mother was a Soviet space dog who orbited Earth aboard Sputnik 2. President Obama's two Portuguese water dogs, Bo and Sonny, were the most recent presidential pets until now, with President Trump being the first U.S. president in more than 100 years to not have a pet. He reportedly doesn't like dogs and said he doesn't have time for animals. And finally, we note that shelter dog adoptions are up 9% from last year, according to Shelter Animals Count, with many places reporting dog shortages amid the pandemic. Still lots to get to here tonight on Prime. There are several states on high alert. It's going to be a busy week on the weather front. Rob Marciano is standing by. And we can't get enough of this gymnast move. We'll see her in action in just a little bit. But first, to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. For Streaming now on ABC News Live. We will guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Big, big hug, Richard. We 
tell all our patients how much they love to hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. <laughs> There's nobody that has not been touched by this pandemic. It's tough right now because, you know, we're struggling. We have serious demand issues. For the first time ever, we have to have each other's backs. I see color. Here we go. We're all in this together, and we have to make this work. Well done, Spurs. This song we got. Woo! Wicked Tuna, new season, Sunday, February 21st at 9 on National Geographic. Yes, mornings may look different these days, but where you start your day, where you spend your mornings, where you get connected to everything that's happening. And face it, there's a whole lot happening in our world these days. Where you get all the breaking new information of the day to help you navigate through these times. That's why we're here. Good morning, sunshine. And making sure you start your day off with a smile and some sunshine. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Oh, how I love saying that. Most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Friday nights, 9 8 Central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime. 2020, Friday nights, 9 8 Central on ABC. to conduct proceedings on behalf of the House concerning the impeachment of Donald John Trump, former President of the United States. The House impeachment managers have gathered to deliver their article of impeachment to the Senate for the second impeachment trial of former President Donald Trump. Again, this is something we have never seen before in all of American history. Donald John Trump engaged in high crimes and misdemeanors by inciting violence against the government of the United States. Shortly before the joint session commenced, President Trump addressed a crowd at the Ellipse in Washington, D.C. There, he reiterated false claims that we won this election and we won it by a landslide. He also willfully made statements that in context encouraged and foreseeably resulted in lawless action at the Capitol, such as, if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. The senators will be sworn in tomorrow, but the trial will not begin until the week of February 8th. President Biden's latest action overturning a Trump administration measure lifts the prohibition on transgender people serving in the military. The president signing an executive order that immediately prohibits any service member from being forced out of the military on the basis of gender identity, reversing the controversial policy announced by President Trump in 2017. And what I'm doing is enabling all qualified Americans to serve their country in uniform. The executive order the president signed states America is stronger at home and around the world when it is in Inclusive. The military is no exception. I'm a Christian, a wife, a mom. In a video posted to Twitter this morning, Trump's former White House press secretary, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, says she's running for governor of Arkansas. Everything we love about America is at stake. And with the radical left now in control of Washington, your governor is your last line of defense. Sanders left the White House in 2019. Some destructive protests out west. This in reaction to a police officer who struck and injured demonstrators. Protesters setting a fire, damaging buildings, and marching through the streets of Tacoma, Washington yesterday. Demonstrators gathering near the intersection where an officer's SUV plowed right through a crowd of people as they swarmed the vehicle. This happened on Saturday night. The officer responding to an illegal street racing scene. The officer is now on administrative leave. Far left groups blamed for the ongoing unrest in cities like Portland and Seattle. Since President Biden's inauguration, the White House has condemned the violence. A worst case scenario. That's what scientists say is happening as the rate of ice disappearing across the planet is speeding up. That melting ice contributing to global warming and rising sea levels. Using satellite data, a research team was able to carry 
out the first global ice loss survey. The findings revealed 28 trillion tons of ice was lost between 1994 and 2017, acceleration primarily happening in Greenland and Antarctica. The grim results published in the journal The Cryosphere comes as 2020 was tied for the hottest year on record. We all saw bundled up Bernie become a meme. Now he's cashing in for some good. After his appearance during President Biden's inauguration went viral, the cozy senator from Vermont printed his outfit of the day on sweatshirts, selling for $45. The black cotton crew neck sweater sold out instantly. And Senator Sanders is donating 100% of those funds to Meals on Wheels Vermont. A fashion icon is born. Welcome back. The treacherous conditions that led to this pileup over the weekend in Detroit and made it hard for this driver to stay on the road south of Flagstaff, Arizona, will impact millions. There are a series of storms that are going to make it difficult and quite messy out on the roads coming up this week. Rob, what are you tracking for us? Well, Lindsay, a very active pattern now. We've got two big storms hitting the U.S. and a third one uh, right behind that. Uh, take a look at the radar. We've got mixed precipitation, snow and rain from Delaware and D.C. all the way back through Southern California. That low you see over Vegas, that's bringing some snow near the Vegas uh, Strip. That's a doozy. But the one over Kansas City right now, that's been bringing heavy snow to parts of Nebraska and Iowa. They'll probably see a foot or more snow. Chicago could see up to a foot as this thing pours in there later on tonight. Detroit as well. Kind of a mixed long I-80. Icy conditions and through parts of Pennsylvania, but the snow shield gets to the New York metro area by mid morning, pushes up through Boston and Albany late in the day. I-95 cities won't see a whole lot, maybe one, two, three inches of snow, but uh, some bigger amounts as you go farther north, and certainly Chicago will see its biggest snow of the season, and there's another one, two storms behind this one. Got to get the salt and shovels ready. Rob Marciano, our thanks to you. Alexei Navalny, poisoned by nerve agent, survives in a German hospital, returns to Russia, and is promptly arrested. But Putin is learning it may be hard to ignore the opposition leader after a series of protests across the country that led to thousands of arrests. But what now? Patrick Rievel files this report. These are scenes the Kremlin doesn't like to see. On Saturday, tens of thousands of people joining protests across Russia. The biggest show of opposition to Vladimir Putin in years. Authorities bluntly confronted it. Riot police at times beating the crowds. The number of people detained now over 3,700, according to a monitoring group. The protesters demanding freedom for Alexei Navalny. Vladimir Putin's fiercest critic, Navalny came back to Russia just over a week ago, returning for the first time since being nearly fatally poisoned by a nerve agent over the summer. Navalny was detained as soon as he landed in Moscow, then sent to prison by a makeshift court. I am calling upon you, don't be silent, resist, take to the streets. Nobody can protect us but ourselves. We are so many that if we want to achieve something, we will achieve it. His call to protest Saturday seen as a test of his influence and whether his gamble to return to Russia would pay off. For now, it seems it did. Protests taking place in over 100 cities, spreading to places where Navalny usually goes ignored. In Vladivostok, 6,000 miles from Moscow, police charging a crowd. People braving Russian winter temperatures, often below minus 20 degrees. In Siberia, riot police chasing demonstrators onto the ice of a frozen river. Outside Moscow, crowds were only in the thousands. But in a country where so much effort is put into suppressing opposition, their spread and energy was different. Together we're a force. It's a time of change. Don't be afraid. Get out. Together we can do it. Navalny has built his following through video investigations, exposing alleged corruption among Putin's allies. Last week, after he was jailed, he released a new one, 
a film that claims to expose a secret palace built by Putin on Russia's Black Sea. Navalny alleging the palace filled with staggering luxury, a personal casino, theatre, an underground ice hockey rink. Putin in a rare step commenting on the investigation today, saying it's a hack job and boring. The film, though, now has been watched roughly 90 million times on YouTube. The Kremlin has long tried to dismiss Navalny as not a serious opponent, but his return, having survived the poisoning attempt, is making that much harder. <laughs> Authorities instead having to fall back on more repression. Senya and Dmitry decided to go to the protest in Moscow despite warnings from authorities that anyone attending faced arrest. So, like, to be prepared, we took, like, our passports, copy of passports, just to be prepared for, for anything. But that's, that's the plan, yes. And we have books. If we, yeah. uh, if we will spend the night in the police station, we have books. We can read. <laughs> so we are ready. They said Navalny now represents more than himself. You can trust Alexei Navalny or not, but the things that happen with him is absolutely awful. I really strongly believe in the power of small steps, and that's my small step that I'm trying to do today. Navalny's team have called for more protests next weekend. The Kremlin now has to decide whether to keep Navalny imprisoned long term. A court hearing next week could see him jailed for years. More protests are certain. Unsettling signs for the Kremlin of a changing Russia. Patrick Rival for ABC News Live. Our thanks to Patrick for that. The NFL has long promised to diversify their coaching ranks, but that promise has fallen short again. Of the seven head coaching jobs available so far this season, six of the openings have now been filled and none of the six are black. Despite the Rooney rule, which mandates that the teams must interview diverse candidates for open coaching positions, the number of African-American head coaches stands at two in a league where 70% of the players are black. Here to discuss with us now is Herm Edwards, who spent eight years in the league as head coach of the New York Jets and the Kansas City Chiefs. He is now head football coach of the Arizona State Sun Devils. Thanks so much for joining us, Coach. Thank you for having me. So the 2020 National Football League racial and gender report card reports a D-plus for racial hiring grade for NFL head coaches. When the Rooney Rule was implemented in 2003, you were one of just two black head coaches in the NFL. Uh, the number went up to as many as eight minority head coaches. But now we're back to similar numbers from 2003. We're going backwards. What's the problem here? Well, I think when you look at it historically, uh, the National Football League came into to existence in 1921. It's 100 years, and there's actually only been 29 head coaches that have uh, been able to uh, coach in that league. So the history kind of is, is kind of repeating itself a little bit here. But I think you've got, you've got to look at the real crux of this. When you think about the hiring process in the National Football League, it comes from three entities, whether you be a defensive coordinator or offensive coordinator or a quarterback coach. So that's 96 spots that you can basically have in the National Football League that allows you somewhat of a leadership position. With that being said, when you look at those spots uh, that I just talked about, the 96 opportunities, those are not filled with a lot of people of color. Uh, when you look at the hiring process, who does the hiring? It's generally GMs. There's 32 jobs in the National Football League. Four of them happen to be men of color. Uh, there is no ownership party that, that are men of color. So I think socially and your, your social connection to people has a lot to do with this and where you get your information from. And that seems to be the problem here. You talk about socially. I mean, 2020 was a year of great social change and, and so-called racial reckoning. So how do you reconcile the league and the team's efforts around racial justice in light of the small number of black coaches, especially head coaches? Well, I think putting them in position where they have an opportunity to lead. Uh, when you think about the league right now, uh, they've hired, what, six coaches. Five of them have been offensive-minded guys. There's only been one that has not been an offensive guy, and he went to the New York Jets. He's a defensive coach. So I think right now the, the league is really trying to trending toward offensive coaches. But it still goes back to the 96 positions in the National Football League where you're in a position to lead men, whether it's on offense, defense, or the quarterback coach. 
who sits in those chairs. That, I think that is very, very important. And until we get that solved, you're always going to have an issue about the hiring process. But again, if we go back to that idea that 70% of the NFL players are black, there were seven open coaching positions this season. Five of them have been filled by white men. One remains open. The NFL has been having these conversations for a long time, and the owners have to know at this point that they're going to get tremendous pushback if they don't have representation in the coaching ranks. Where's the disconnect here? Well, we say that. But that's really not the case, is it? We say that every year, but some things just seem to stay the same. I mentioned earlier, uh, in 100 years, there's been 29 black head coaches or minority head coaches, I should say it that way. That's in 100 years. Right. So we can say what we want. We can get angry. We can have these, uh, we, we can have these talks and, and we can say it, but they have to have the ability to do it. And the way you have to do it is within your organization. There, of course, is the NFL's Rooney Rule. There are special coalitions and development opportunities for black coaches. What do you think can be done for the interviewing process to be more transparent, to discourage owners and ADs from moving the goalposts, so to speak, when a black coach is up for the job? Well, I think that this can happen, too. Um, you know, sometimes the interview process is more of I'm going to check the box, right? Right. I'm going to check the box and say, I. and here's the problem. If you're a minority candidate and you do, let's say, three or four interviews every year and three years go by of you interviewing and not be able to get a job, you're probably not going to get a job, right? Because they're going to say, he's had 12 interviews in three years and no one's hired him, so why should I hire him? So it can, all, it can also be a, a little bit of a deterrent because if, if you continue to get interviewed but never get a job, that becomes a problem. What advice would you give to black coaches in the profession who want to get in or stay in? Because it doesn't always seem like being the best is working. What else can they do? And also, conversely, if you were in a room right now uh, with the owners of the NFL teams, what would you say to them? You, 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 have, to, you have to start a pipeline. And, 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 you know, we talk about pro football a lot, which is, which, is, which is what we're talking about right now. But think about college football. What is college football like? <laughs> I'll give you some numbers of college football aren't very good either. There's 130 Division I schools in college football. There's only 12 black head coaches out of 130 jobs. Right. So there's a, there's a, it's like anything else. You have to grow up in the pipeline. All right. Before we let you go, Coach, got to talk Super Bowl. Uh, Want to find out, you know, yesterday we determined that it's going to be Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers versus the Kansas City Chiefs led by Patrick Mahomes. Talk to us about these two quarterbacks and also this game. Well, I think it's, it's one guy, and, and, I, and I dubbed him when I was in television, Captain America. <laughs> Tom Brady. He is truly Captain America. And you have a, another young one that obviously he continues on this pace. He's going to break all the records. And we know Tom Brady is a first ballot Hall of Famer, rightly so. Um, you have a young, a young quarterback that is just tremendous. And they have a fantastic football team. He's been in the championship game, what, three years in a row now. He's going back to his second Super Bowl. So I think you have a little bit of the old school and the young, and right. the young one, right? And it's a, it's a wonderful matchup of one quarterback playing what's inside the pocket and making things happen. And you have another one that when he gets out of the pocket, that's when he's the most uh, dangerous to you as, as a defensive guy. So it ought to be a fun Super Bowl to watch. Coach Herm Edwards, thanks so much for your time tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you. And when we come back, the moves that have made the Internet go wild. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source of ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN. And it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. We will guide you through it all tonight. 
have made it through another week together. Big hug, Richard. We tell all our patients how much they're loved. We hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. <laughs>
This is what being live is all about. I can see, I mean, this is 